Hello, I'm Eric Landrum along with Garth Newfeld, and welcome to a very special Psych Session sidebar or special bonus episode. This is a crossover episode with Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology at psychi.org, and their Psych Everywhere podcast, which is available on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. The topic of our discussion was COVID 19 and how to cope with the pandemic. I was able to speak recently with Kathy Becker Blease, the director of the School of Psychological Science, uh, and Regan Gurung, the director of general psychology program and the interim executive director for the Center of Teaching and Learning. And these two friends of mine are both from Oregon State University. Also, Regan currently serves as the president of Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. So we got together over the internet and we discussed COVID-19 and the effect it's having on students and faculty and what we can do and what the current issues are. And we thought this might be of interest to listeners of both the Psych Everywhere podcast as well as our Psych Sessions listeners. Just to give you a couple of quick previews before we get to our interview, uh, we spoke about the uh, course that Kathy and Regan decided to um, invent on the fly, which is called Punch Through Pandemics with Psychological Science. Uh, We talked about the tips that they offer in the course about coping and resilience. Um, We talked about the Help Help Me initiative that I had during my presidential year during Psychi. Uh, We talked a little bit about some unintended positive consequences that are emerging uh, during this pandemic. Uh, We tiptoed very gently about um, politics and uh, the impact of politicians being able to read and interpret psychological data. And then we tried to end on a positive note, which I believe my colleagues were able to do. So we hope that you will enjoy this special crossover sidebar episode. I am with uh, Kathy becker Blease from Oregon State University and Regan A.R. Gorung from uh, Oregon State University. Thank you both for being here today. And thank you, Eric, for hosting us. And on behalf of uh, Psychi and the Psych Everywhere podcasts, it's wonderful to have a crossover opportunity. Yeah, thanks for having us, Eric. Thank you, Kathy. So I've got a couple of questions. I know that both of you are very, very busy and very important, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, But before I get to the questions, I've got to ask you about this. Uh, COVID-19 hits. uh, Everybody is scrambling and doing the grand pivot. Um, And uh, in the middle of this, uh, two very crazy busy people one who's running a a school of psychological science the other one who is running a general psychology program and interim um, center for uh, teaching director you decide to launch a new class what is up with that yeah kathy yeah let's let's have it let's have the story yeah, and not just one class, cause, and not just two classes, because that you know That's that right. wouldn't have been enough. We had ECAM, but a, an online class, a Corvallis class, which of course is running remote, and then the super large, you know, massive open class um, with members of the public. And we did decided to do all three for pretty much the same reason, which was that we knew psychology would have a lot to offer students in the world, and we wanted to make it as available as possible. And there was sort of no time like that week of pivoting you just described, Eric, to make it happen. Yeah, this is the this is the classic case of uh, you know getting a text message that says something like, "I have this crazy idea. What do you think?" And uh, you know that's how I think crazy ideas get into uh, really cool, fun little projects. And yeah, I know, Eric, you've okay. had a lot of those. Yeah. Okay, but but uh, yeah right but but it's <laughs> it's not a fun little project you're assembling a course to, to with two other people three all together on the fly for how many people who enrolled in it uh 3756 right now <laughs> so this would be a good time to get like and- huge shout out to our co-teacher Kate Gallagher who um covers mindfulness and um that aspect of it for us 
and uh, she does a lot of uh, she helps a lot. And I think Eric, another another element though, and this you know really really buying into the whole psychology is everywhere concept is, you know, yes, you're right. It's you know at first. It sounds like a crazy thing to do, but then, and I know this is something you care a lot about as well, Eric, and I have a question for you as well. So don't, don't, don't let me not ask that. But I think, you know, when you think about what's going on right now and you think about all that psychology can share, I mean, this, uh, in many ways, this is exactly the kind of thing that psychology is great for. And quite honestly, one of the things that made it easier is that so much of this course is it's almost like an applied health psychology course. So, you know, I've been teaching health psychology for 15 to 20 years and uh, reimagining health psychology for the pandemic was actually, uh, 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 and I will say this without, and you know, I'm not getting a fun challenge. It was a fun challenge to say, here's this theoretical stuff. How can we truly make it applied? How can we truly put it in a, in a way that students can can use? And then when you pair it with Kathy's expertise on trauma and and things like that, I mean, it's just the it's the perfect opportunity to get psychology out there. I I don't doubt that it's a perfect opportunity and that it's a great trio of people. I'm just thinking that in the middle of all this and taking care of your families and sheltering in place and all the transitions, three people said, hey, we don't have enough to do. Let's invent a new course and let's offer it to 3,000 people and give it away for free. Um, I I helped record a couple of quick podcasts. You know, some people might write a blog. I mean, some people might do a couple of things that take a few minutes or a few hours. All y'all are really very impressive in what you've done. So I I just wanted to acknowledge that right away. Uh, talk about punching COVID nineteen. I mean. Let's make sure that in the notes to the podcast release for both Psych Sessions and Psych Eye, that a website link is provided to the materials that you all are giving away for free online. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we had some things that we were going to talk about. I know we don't have a lot of time here. This is going to be a relatively short episode. And I know, Regan, you had a question there. But um, what kind of tips are you giving in your class about, for example, managing, working at home, coping with emails, not forgetting assignments, and planning for the future? Those would be the four quick hits that I'll put out there. Yeah, let, let me hit the email one, uh, because I've been thinking a lot about email, and especially for, for students listening, I know for a lot of students, coping with the email has been a big issue. Uh, I actually spoke to a student who said uh, he checks email once a day, and when he checks it, he's overwhelmed by how much there is. And I think, uh, unfortunately, with us all working home, all of us working home and so much going on via email, uh, checking email more frequently is actually now one of those survival techniques is check it more frequently so you're not hit with so much. Uh, and actually coming up with, but by the same token, not going the other direction when you are buried in email all the time. And I know I personally, and I'm sure the two of you too, have put into place some strategies to help coping with email. And I think that's one big tip right there is have a strategy, have a strategy, because otherwise you're going to miss stuff. Um, and especially when students are taking maybe up to five classes online, that's a lot of class email that's going to be coming in, especially if you haven't set your uh, learning management system to turn off announcements and everything's pouring into email. Big tip right there, explicitly, consciously have a strategy for dealing with your email. There are lots of sub, sub things that can go there. But that's needed to say that about email because, boy, email can be a stressor. And, Kathy, if I can follow up with you a little bit, I remember from our podcast conversation, you talked a little bit about your training and trauma. And if I remember from the end of that conversation, you're talking about being, you know, the the school director and how, you know, a hard day being a school director was nothing compared to being to the type of things that you did, you know, as part of your dissertation and training work. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So are, are you feeling like you're back in the days of that 
trauma training or is it like that at all? Or what, what do you bring yeah. from that training yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful here? Right. So I think when I recorded my welcome video to the, the class we just <laughs> talked about, I think I mentioned that, you know, part of what you learn when you study trauma is just how resilient people are. And a lot of times that resilience is hidden unless you kind of know where to look for it. So I know already that humans have the capacity to get through a lot. You know, I'm, I'm uh, not a, not a super active member, but I am a member of a, of an inner, um, Division Task Force on APA on the response to COVID and the Division 56 trauma psychology is, um, taking, is a, taking a lead role in. And certainly we have trauma psychologists working with the, um, providers in New York City who are making these decisions about, you know, who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. Those folks are dealing with real trauma. That's, they're, they're adapting, um, what we know from combat situations and to healthcare delivery. And that has been, really harrowing um, and really amazing to see that psychology is something to offer that real extreme situation that's different from what Regan and Kate and I are doing. It's definitely not, you know, deep breathing and regular coping. That's, that's real trauma. And so for me, the line is pretty clear that for most of us, what we're dealing with is, is stressful, but it's within the normal range. And it's what our bodies have been designed to sort of get activated and, you know, to respond and then, you know, to, to, a, to a stressor. So to me, there's a clear line and it's stressful and unpleasant and I'm not happy about it, but it's still quite different from what we think of as, as trauma. So that, that's how I think of it as a trauma psychologist. It's not to diminish the extreme hardships that some people are experiencing and that they're labeling trauma, you know, small C, but as a like, trauma psychologist, we still would reserve, you know, a, a different kind of experience for what we would call what we would call trauma, it's still a little different. Well, and I, I, I appreciate that perspective. And I think anyone any, anyone who can see the big picture also would agree with you. I mean, it, it's just not the same. I mean, we're all thrown into a situation where our daily routines are different. But like you said, that is not the same trauma as someone who um, – who has undergone the things that we talked about it during the podcast, like a sexual abuse type of trauma or a, a kidnapping type of trauma is not the same as a, as a COVID-19, I might have the virus type of trauma, certainly anxiety provoking, but, but very different. And I think it's very fair for you to point that out. And I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Yeah. I like to say one more <laughs> thing, which is that when universities close, some students um, did return home to, to some of the homes that we that you were just talking about. So when I, I guess when I said, you know, for most of us, what we experience is in the normal range. That's, that there are there is a group of um, of students and kids who actually are now um, quarantined with, um, you know, in really abusive homes. So I I guess I was speaking more about for most of us, you know, this this is stressful. But man, most of us have. Our homes are still a safe place, but um, yeah. yeah. So, so again, I draw a distinction between yeah, it's stressful. I can't go outside, and yeah, it's stressful, and I'm not even safe here. So we we do kind of have that perspective. It's a different, um, it's just a different kind of coping. It's it's a different thing altogether. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, you know, I know that the universities, I was going to say around the country, but really around the world, are now struggling with. What do we do in the fall? You know, what do we do in the fall quarter or the fall semester? Um, you know, do do we have students continue to be working online? Um, how do we do this planning for the future? I mean, some universities are thinking we're not going to get our out-of-state students back, but we'll have an influx of in-state students uh, who are online who are going to come back. And, you know, what types of advice would the two of you have about uh, students thinking about their futures. Uh, okay, God, I'll, been, I'll take that one because yeah. uh, it's funny. Just this morning, my oldest 17 year old took an AP exam online, and uh, it is, she's got another year to go, but um, I, I, you know, it, it still, still could be that she goes to college before there's a vaccine, and it's something to think about. Um, I think the universities, um, at least Oregon State University, but, I, but what we're doing, I think, is um, consistent with many universities across the country is really extraordinary planning. So we have access to our own in on-site health center, our own 
school, public health, and um, our own, um, you know, residence halls and restaurants and all of that. So we can think of what would it take for people to come back safely as, as an entire ecosystem. And, and so you can think a little more um, strategically about how you can manage the risks across, you know, for, for OSU as like a small city, you know? And so um, when I think about, um, you know, my own, if I were in a situation a year later and my own kid had to make a decision about going or not going, I think I sure would have a lot of questions about the planning that any institution was doing, but um, really, really thoughtful work going on. And I think the one misconception that's out there is that it's like places are either going to be open, fully back, back face to face, or they're going to be fully remote. And, and that's just not the case. They're, that most of us are going to be in some area in the middle. So you might have some classes, but you won't have all of your classes. You you might get your field experience or your lab class, but you might not have your intro site class meeting face-to-face. -face. So we're going to have a lot of innovative ways to mitigate the risk. And everybody's thinking about how to maximize um, what students tell us is important to them, which is connection with their faculty members and um, and and safety, of course. So. I'm actually, uh, as stressful as it is and as, as uncertain as it is, I feel better about the planning at a university than I do in a county or, a, uh, you know, another uh, unit, another, you know, community. Um, so that's, so I think it remains to be seen if students will return um, or not return or what, what they're going to do. But I, I think I would feel okay sending my kids to a university like OSU. Yeah, I think the challenges are, are, are going to be epic. You know, at Boise State, we've been talking about, you know, when students come back, you know, how do you keep the social distancing? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, if we're, if we're together on campus, you know, how can you use this hybrid or high flex class approach to have your Tuesday, Thursday, where some come on Tuesday, some come on Thursday, you're utilizing your space well, but how do you leave enough time to clean classrooms in between passing periods? And and do you, how do you make sure you have enough cleaning supplies on campus to make sure? I mean, so, you know, we're working through the, the logistics here in May, hoping that we'll be ready in August and September. I think, Regan, you were going to add to that well, as well. I, I think the three of us, by virtue of the different administrative hats that we wear, actually have so much more knowledge about what universities are doing, so much so that it's easier for us to feel confident. And, you know, to go back to your question, I think that's one thing students and their parents need to hear is that, we, you know, there is a lot going on on most campuses, and I say most campuses, uh, the ones that I know of and I've been looking at many, it's actually really reassuring to see all the things being put into place. And, you know, beyond just beyond just knowing what OSU is doing, which is a tremendous amount, uh, I think, uh, interestingly enough, Corvallis and OSU are one of the few cities in the country where there is already in place a population testing system. And I know that makes me, and this is the the trace study uh, that that's been in in progress for some time. And because of this trace study, which is literally random sampling of population to get a feel for cases and so on and so forth, uh, I feel a lot more confident that the finger is truly on the pulse of what's going on. Uh, and so to convert that into advice or, you know, for, for listeners, it's, you know, really get a good sense of what that individual, uh, university and that individual city is doing and, you know, make your decisions accordingly. Because I know because of a lot of the knowledge of what's going on here, I do feel very comfortable, like, like Kathy mentioned as well. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that, that we, we, we can't lose in all of this is that we also have to consider uh, faculty as well. Um, Absolutely. We need to be thinking about um, not only faculty members' health and making sure that they are comfortable and they're not immunosuppressed, but also uh, whether or not schools will be open in the fall. And I know uh, in my own department, a number of my colleagues have little ones who are in school. And, and if our schools aren't open in the fall, it's going to be, you know, it's one thing to pivot on an emergency, 
but it's another thing to go into a, a full blown fall semester for us and and having those the, those professors and parents doing both of those jobs simultaneously. And we're going to have to figure out a way to provide some support and some infrastructure and some relief because that's going to be really difficult. We we weathered the emergency pivot, but if 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 we don't have some sort of solution, we're we're going to have to do something. So you know, Eric, let me pick up on that and and ask you a question. Uh, speaking about you know, coping with all of this. Um, one of one of your uh, neat initiatives during your presidency of, uh, of Psychi, which was very recently, was the the get help, uh, help help me. And I think you know I thought a lot about and I think a lot about your help help me initiative because one of the things that we talk about in class is you know we're all coping with a lot, and as resilient as human beings are. And as much as we can tolerate and, you know, we can tolerate a fair amount, there is a point where you need to get help. Uh, you know, do you want to, can you say something about your help helped me initiative? And because I really think it bears here on what we should be thinking about and how we cope. Yeah, I appreciate that. So in 2017, 2018, I was honored to be the international president of Saikai, and that was my initiative. And the, the long and short of it is, you know, we all, we all understand as psychologists and psychology majors that help seeking is stigmatized and that uh, mental health uh, also needs to be destigmatized in terms of having a mental illness needs to be destigmatized and help seeking needs to be promoted. And so I, I tried a little bit during my during my term to to work on initiatives. And even though I'm no longer on the board of directors. I, I still have an interest in that. And so um, the notion would be just to try to find ways on a campus, whether you're a member of a psych, psych, psych high, uh, chapter or not, uh, psych major or psych minor, to try to find ways on your campus to promote the notion that um, seeking help is normal. It's a good thing. Uh, there is nothing to be stigmatized about it. And that doesn't have to be necessarily through a licensed therapist. It could be through your pastor. It could be through your church. It could be through uh, some sort of Alcoholics Anonymous or NA or whatever type of program that you might need uh, assistance from. Uh, but I, I think in this time, you know, you know, I kind of started off uh, COVID-19 with the joke that as an introvert, I think I've seen this meme on social media. As an introvert, I've been training for this my entire life. And that, that's a little bit humorous at first, um, but introverts need to have, you know, social contact as well. And, um, you know, people are really hurting uh, from the lack of social contact. And I think people have realized that, you know, calling it social distancing has been a mistake. Uh, we probably should have called it physical distancing. And so um, I appreciate you, Regan, asking me about that. And I, I think what um, college students can do uh, over the summer and coming back in the fall, whether we're together physically or not, is just to make sure that your friends, your colleagues, your the people that you're working on projects on, on campus in classes, just to make sure that um, you're not socially distant you're physically distant as you need to be, and you're careful, especially if you're immunosuppressed, but uh, that we're checking in on each other as we need to. Absolutely. And I can follow up on that and say that um, one of the things that's been really an unexpected event, you know, blessing in disguise is that um, the, the professional psychotherapy help that um, members of my family need, it used to take us a long time to drive to see those providers, and we'd have to leave work in school to do it. And now we're able to do that um, through Zoom. And uh, it's actually been a really great benefit. And a lot of people don't know that insurance companies have changed their policies to make it easier so that they'll pay for telehealth. And in fact, I understand our student health center is actually trying to get more people to call in because um, our students don't know that they can still receive um, therapy and counseling from the student health center or from the student counseling center at home as long as they're in Oregon because we haven't quite fixed those the licensing issues is there yet, but um, I just want to put a plug in for um, teletherapy, telehealth, because it's 
um, increasingly available rather than the other way around and increasingly covered. Well, and Kathy, I appreciate that because um, there are silver linings that have happened during this process that, you know, we don't would normally tout or acknowledge. I mean, there are places in the world where environmental conditions have gotten better because cars have not been on the road as much. People have gotten refund checks for their insurance because they're not driving as many miles. Of course, we wouldn't have, we we don't want the 70,000 deaths and the 500,000 people getting sick. Of course, we wouldn't want that. But there, there are some silver linings that we, we can take out of this uh, to make the best of a really negative situation. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Eric, along those lines, I think we are also, and again, I'm right with you, is, is it, this is not the best way for this to happen. But what this, what the pandemic is also highlighting for us is just the absolute role that psychology can play. And, you know, even going beyond uh, mental health and, and therapy resources, I think, you know, and, and that's something even the lay public are aware of, right? Go get help when you can, although it's not done enough and it should be. But interestingly enough, even when you don't venture into clinical levels, there are uh, non-clinical psychological phenomena that can help us all out while we cope with this. Uh, Just recently in class, uh, we had uh, Dr. Jennifer Lerner, who's a helming a very large study out of Harvard, and this is an international study. And this was actually pretty exciting for the class to hear because she came and was a guest lecturer, and she shared uh, details on a study on 55 different countries, uh, and it was a brief reappraisal intervention study where they literally had four groups where one group was, you know, cope how you normally would, and three other groups were taking psychological reappraisals of uh, and interventions and having participants actually try a different way of reappraising things, you know, either looking on the bright side or, or for example, finding meaning. And I think here's this, this way where we may be able to tell how these psychological ways of thinking can play a significant role in the level of positive and negative emotion that we feel. So, you know, it's just it's just mind boggling to see how we can get more people to use psychology that can help them feel better, at, you know, more positive emotions and, and, and fewer negative emotions. Well, and, and here's the other part that we don't talk about very often. And I'm going to try to tiptoe really gently here is that, you know, political decisions matter, political decisions and governmental um entities uh, can save lives and cost lives. I mean, the work of the CDC is really important and listening to them and getting them the resources and giving scientists the freedom to do their job without impediments matters. And having political leaders who have all the information and who are completely competent, that really matters Uh, to our lives and to people's lives. And we don't often talk about that as academics, at least not in psychology, Uh, you know, because for whatever reason, we're not comfortable with it or we're not experts about it. But, you know, maybe this after this is over, maybe we should start talking about it more often. How do our leaders use data? All right. I'm going to give the two of you a last chance at the last word before I let you go. Kathy, all yours. Uh, okay, last word for students is that, uh, you know, one of the great things about um, working at OSU is we have this uh, long-serving president, President Ed Ray, who's um, retiring this year, and I've learned a lot from him. And one of the things Ed Ray is always telling us is that, you know, uh, don't worry about the future, that um, the college students, the high school students coming through give him so much hope. And that's, uh, I think, on you know, the triple now. Um, Watching, I mean, young, this is as stressful as this is, as challenging as it is with the Tuesday classroom and the remote learning and all of that. Um, just, just a lot of hope going forward um, with the generation that's um, coming up through college now. And, you know, we'll always have this experience. We'll always, you know, we'll learn from it. And so that's, that 
group of people going back to why are we teaching the class, you know, getting to be around, you know, young, resilient people who are, who are struggling sometimes or figuring it out, you know, just gives us so much hope. So lot, lots of hope for the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great place to end. And I want to thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Mm-hmm.